Inventing Future Cities um, is written by Michael Batty and for the large proportion of his career is a UCL professor and he's been there since 1995 and really won a lot of awards so he's really a big name on campus in the planning world and partially because he's also produced a large body of academic work which also includes the development of analytical methods and computer models for simulating the structure of cities and regions and he also has a background in graphics um, and has published on topics concerning urban modelling and the visual representation of cities. So I think all of this makes him an ideal and relevant candidate for us. And throughout his book, he talks about the representation methods or even makes recommendations on how we may use our tools better to show unseen or invisible networks. Um, and as well as suggesting aspects of urban environments, which we could do with representing better to understand the real complexity within the contemporary context. And you can watch him on TEDx and he's done a lot of international lectures. Um, he's northern and seems dead nice. And I think he's, he's just really patient um, and takes his time to clarify quite abstract concepts. So this text is, it is highly readable, but you can always check out his lectures online as well. Inventing Future Cities was published in 2018, so not that long ago, um, and the overarching theme or argument of the text is how we view the city either as a product of prediction or the city is viewed or should be viewed as an ongoing process of invention. So essentially Batty is trying to change our mindset from one of prediction to one of invention, which might not feel like a big difference, but he really does distinguish between them in his first chapter because in his view, the future is actually the accumulation of events which occur randomly in its size, in its scale, in its space and time. So he draws the understanding of there aren't really any single events which are necessarily more probable than any other at any one point from theorists like Karl Popper who points out that theories which we understand to be good and of quality ultimately just predict possibilities by looking at the past and making a hypothesis and then is reinforced and continually by the present but there's always a possibility of the emergence of a new fact which will demonstrate that the theory could be false or is false and he calls this the inductive method so really no amount of observations which confirm a hypothesis can actually lead to the truth because these theories are basically just working templates until something or someone comes along to disprove them. Which is a pretty big and almost abstract statement, so to apply this to a real world scenario, Batty talks about the observations of Nicholas Taylor who points out that there was an era where the empirical law um, and consensus was that all swans were white and this was because people could only observe white swans in England and so that was the general belief and it was the case until someone went to Australia and saw a black swan and similarly in the case of the example of the induction turkey, um, a turkey could perhaps theorise every day will consist of the experiences of sleeping, waking, eating and living until of course it's proved wrong the day before Christmas when it expects to repeat the cycle but you know is instead murdered and then served for lunch or dinner and these theories were ultimately flawed because the turkey and the observers of swans did not consider and really could not consider the wider context of possibilities. So in comparison, he describes complexity theory, which deals with emergent structures where elements can actually evolve and in this way allows for the broadening of our frames of reference. It still draws on past events, but takes into account routine behaviours as well as the emergent abilities of systems to manifest qualitative differences. And therefore, complexity theory can deal with a concept like cities, which really begin from the bottom up processes and are largely the accumulation of real events which occur randomly in size, scale, space and time. So in light of this perspective and understanding of complexity, instead of trying to theorise the city which is or seems inherently unpredictable, Batty instead sets the scene for giving us the tools for thinking about cities, which actually largely focuses on the functions rather than the actual physical architecture of cities. So the rest of the book is mainly about the influences which have caused or are causing the city's functions to transition, which really in turn 
will define how the future city is invented and he organises this logic into five principles or laws which he considers applies to all cities through all time and this almost seems um, counterintuitive because this comes after laying down the kind of groundwork for a wholly unpredictable future but these principles are about the restrictions and limitations of the physical world of our time and Batty does caveat a lot of his work throughout his book and he often says that we can likely with relative accuracy sort of speculate what can happen in the next 50 years or so because future changes can disrupt but it, it doesn't really ever destroy the old and so it's just sort of layered on top so in that way the future will always be an amalgamation of old and new but to speculate beyond this time frame when change is continually ongoing um, will be less likely and able to quantify or have some frame of reference as to what underpins new change and so really anything beyond 50 years are, are just speculations and I think that when he says that the only way to know the future city is to invent it part of what he's trying to say is that not only are cities constant developments which almost needs in one sense depends on the knowledge of what you're building from in order to know how to build on it. So I think that this is a good time to kind of address some of the assumptions that I think are natural when seeing the title of this book um, kind of before I launch into the main body of the text and I think what immediately pops to mind are the kind of 2D and 3D visuals we're so used to seeing in lectures and seminars from the likes of Archigram and Corbusier and even the past built works of the top-down designs from Ebenezer Howard and his concept of garden cities but what I think this book does a really good job of is actually myth-busting because in the following Batty points out that these are actually simplifications of cities and they're designed loosely on only one or two determinants, whether this is sort of population density or transport networks, and doesn't actually deal with the realities of the complex systems which globally create cities. So for us especially, the following looks more in depth into how the author recommends we evaluate or reevaluate the urban context. And this is just a warning that the following is a very much abbreviated summary of Batty's reasoning, which allows him to conclude the invention of future cities. So please read the book or the overview to understand how these statements are supported. But for the purpose of fitting all of this content into the video, um, the following has been immensely condensed. In the first chapter, he more or less defines what is likely to go into our cities, so the populations and lifestyle behaviours. This perspective is also largely shaped by Batty's first principle, Zipp's Law. This is determined by a plateauing population growth and the rise of urbanisation via the manifestation of small towns as well as cities and megacities. The author then defines what the city is and he describes them as constellations. Batty builds on von Thunen's standard model and agrees that cities will always be structured around their central business districts or cores, but they're also composed of nodes of activity which are then connected via the networks of social and economic interactions, and it's these geometries which encompass the physical and ethereal networks of contemporary society which makes the city. So for example, the physical road networks which tie a city together, as well as the unseen online interactions for economic exchange and transition, all creates a passage of flows which define the city. So in other words, he rationalises that the city is not so much defined by the actual location of the developments, but by the interactions which happen between them. And he points out that technology is enabling us to interact more away from these places, and the locations which once enabled its associated activities actually no longer anchor them to any specific geographical areas. So it's really only through social preference, which are linked with the laws about geographical nearness and proximity, that we've stayed within the travelable boundaries of cities. Batty then goes on to highlight the use of technology within our everyday environment to allow for the increased efficiencies of our interactions. And he also mentions or points out that nearly all of the activities we do then leave behind partial digital footprints and if we were to view this generation of data in real time because well it's really a byproduct of our interactions and um, this dynamic can be seen as the pulse of a city and these technologies which have defined the century has of course changed the way we interact and behave but 
as mentioned before, only really disrupts the notion of the traditional city as these new behaviours are layered on top of the existing structure. Um, and therefore, this change also naturally aligns with the existing patterns of growth that cities already follow, which Batty condenses to outward, upward and inward, meaning sprawling, regenerating um, and building, which generally involves a skyscraper. I think at this point, although much of this has been condensed, you can kind of see the depth at which Batty investigates the reasoning or logic behind how cities function and how it relates to the changes we're seeing in the collective behaviour and in turn shaping the city. So after he establishes this, he begins to tackle what he sees as the defining core change of this era, which is the continual integration of computation within cities. But he evaluates this by viewing this this particular era of technology in terms of contra-TF waves or K waves, which describe the periods dominated by any single technology. So they begin at invention, then rises to consolidation and integration, then falls with the downswing of investment, which then makes room for new inventions and this starts the ebb and flow of these waves all over again. So Batty then compares era-defining innovations such as the motor car and radios against this wave pattern and assesses the level of change it's caused within cities. And even though this era of technology may be more embedded into environments and could maybe perhaps even create the next K-wave of the smart city, previous K-waves reveal that actually, to speculate how new technologies can affect the future form of cities, um, Batty looks back and actually concludes that the urban forms have a certain superficiality because it doesn't actually necessarily follow function. So although everything looks quite old fashioned in cities of the past, um, definitely around back 100 years ago, they still actually appear to be similar to those of the cities of today. And even we might speculate of the near future. So when we take all these factors and measure them up against the ideal visions of cities which we're so used to, such as Corbusier's City of Tomorrow or Howard's Garden Cities, Batty responds that although these visuals may be useful tools in starting the conversation about future urban environments, and as interesting as they are as thought experiments, they ultimately are defined by too few determinants and neglects the wider set of urban functions which are required by operational cities. But that's not to say that the principles within this book are the only t determinants in which to measure and evaluate cities because Batty himself also recognises that he doesn't fully cover immensely influential themes such as climate change or social inequality within cities and the issues we now face with an ageing population. So although he quickly addresses these in the very last pages, I think it helps demonstrate that cities are the synthesis of complex urban systems which also must respond to many pressures, um, aspirations and forces. Um, but ultimately, all these issues, whether or not we can or will fully study them, will be worked out from the bottom up of our cities. In terms of the takeaways of this book and its relevance to our projects, what Batty has continually stressed throughout this text is the importance of bottom-up approaches, mostly in the way that systems emerge from the patterns of real people and their collective behaviour and reactions to new events. In that way, I think the nature of our briefs and our sites already lean towards Batty's argument for design thinking, but what he's also pointed out is the relevance of complex systems. He advocates the improvement of representation methods to allow for the better study of existing networks in order to design for a number of key determinants. And with that knowledge um, of emergent behaviour, um, which can occur with new stimulus. Um, and I think to incorporate all of this would help us design beyond the constraints of our projects of being thought of just as thought experiments, because as experimental as our projects are, maybe by taking a closer look at the existing networks and possibilities around them, um, and really hopefully being able to respond more carefully, it may add some value to the hours we'll spend speculating over these theoretical projects um and also i think you know at the end of this maybe try try not to be an induction turkey <laughs> <laughs>